the song of the cross, the song of the cross. There's a famous quote in Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment in chapter three, where Raskolnikov says about Petrovich, he's an intelligent man, but it takes something more than intelligence to act intelligently. I wonder what's going on there. Well, I think what Rashkolnikov was talking about was that you need more than just facts to be intelligent. You need empathy. Empathy and emotional intelligence. Because without empathy, intelligence just becomes hard facts, simply determining what's true and what's not. When Paul is talking to the Corinthians, he also is trying to define the limits of intelligence. He quotes God as saying, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. I'll destroy the intelligence of the intelligent. Where is the one who's wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? What's going on here? Why is God saying I'm gonna destroy the wisdom of the wise. This can feel difficult if you're educated, can't it? Especially in our culture, which values intelligence and values wisdom. Justo Gonzalez, when he was talking about third level education, he described it using the metaphor of the stairway, a steep stairway. He says that um, when we write an essay, it's often trying to impress the person on the rung above you, the teacher, the scholar. And education becomes this stairway that we keep climbing higher and higher, and the higher you go, the, the smaller the rungs become because there's less people on the rungs as you get your master's, as you get your PhD. And this helps you get ahead in life, Gonzalez says, because wisdom becomes a thing. It becomes commodified, a thing that can be possessed in order to enhance our status in the world, our honor, our influence. So when God says, I'm going to destroy wisdom, does that mean we should just quit learning, <laughs> find another way? Well, I think... To get at what Paul is saying here, we need to understand the context of the place that he was writing in. There were all these factions in the congregation. Remember last week, we were talking about how the Corinthians were beginning to line themselves up with different people. I follow Paul, but you might follow Apollos or, or Cephas. And it was creating competition. It was creating hierarchy. And as the letter develops, by the time you get towards the end of the Corinthians, you begin to see how this is being worked out in practice. Things have gotten so bad that by the time they come to the Lord's table, those who were honored got a seat at the table and others were being excluded. And those who were honored, the elite assumed, well, we don't need anyone else. We don't need those who are beneath us. We can function autonomously. So the question for Paul is, how do I help repair some of the bridges, some of the broken bridges in, in these cultures? And Paul reasons, um, I need more than just intellect. I can't access people um, simply through the mind. And so he rolls out this hymn a hymn that touches the soul. A while back, I was in a preaching class, and the task was to come up with sermons responding to tragedies. We were each given different case studies, and some were given the task of preaching uh, at a suicide or someone who had a car accident or shootings. And the class was very diverse. It had Americans in it, uh, white Americans, African Americans, Asians, Europeans. And each of us had to prepare a sermon. 
And when we were delivering the sermon, there was a clear pattern that, that emerged. Uh, the, the white people had these very neat managed structures uh, of sermons, clear points. But all of the African Americans started with song. They went straight to music as the balm. They would say something like, let's just pause for a moment and let this song sink in. And it struck me that something was happening here in times of tragedy. Before you try to bring reason in, the best place to go is to music that touches the soul. Paul is trying to do that in 1 Corinthians 1. He's giving the Corinthians a song that allows people to reorient their lives towards God again. No matter what culture, no matter what class you come from, listen to the song that speaks to your deepest longings and brings you to the cross. And the content of this song is interesting because Paul begins to pick apart different cultural assumptions. Verse 22, he says, Now you Greeks, you desire wisdom. You desire to be educated. That's what gives you status in your society. Now not much has changed, has it? One of the motivations of getting a good education is so that we can become autonomous so that we can think for ourselves, stand on our own two feet. We're in a season in, in the Campbell household where we're getting a lot of literature from different colleges. A lot of literature. <laughs> and it's interesting to see what's being offered in, in different institutions. Now, I made the mistake of I don't know what I did on the form. You fill in a form and you get the literature, but I put my name instead of Ian's, so I'm getting all this literature. Karen, <laughs> you can live your best life by going to this college, and it's very attractive. <laughs> and I let myself go there for a moment, and then I pulled myself back in. <laughs> but listen to one excerpt from a college letter we got this week. I'll not name names, but it wasn't Calvin, it wasn't Hope. It was somewhere further away. But listen to how they, they sell their institution. Once you step foot on campus, you'll encounter new philosophies, develop fresh insights, and meet people who will change your perspective. To learn the most about yourself, you need to be able to express yourself freely, wear what you want, be what you want, and speak your mind. Freedom of expression is integral to the university experience. And in the spirit of free expression, please find the enclosed sticker and you get to choose where you want to stick it. <laughs> Let me finish. Stick it to your computer, stick it to your phone, stick it to your water bottle. Applying this sticker might be a small act of free expression, but it could be the first of many. <laughs> freedom of expression. That's the pinnacle, folks. Freedom of expression. That was what the Greeks desired, this kind of wisdom that would lead them on the pathway to freedom. But Paul was trying to persuade the Greeks that the wisdom God was offering was so different. It was more akin to the wisdom talked about in Proverbs 8, where wisdom becomes a person. This lady who calls out in the street, seeking communion with fellow human beings, inviting people to come to her house to feast, and through that communion to learn wisdom, to learn the fear of the Lord. And this wisdom is not about freedom of self-expression, but this wisdom is different. Rather than encouraging separation and self-sufficiency, this wisdom is relational, where we recognize our place in the cosmos, a wisdom deeply tied into creation that lives along the grain of the universe, deep mutuality. 
And so Paul, in talking about wisdom in the Corinthians to the Greeks, was trying to differentiate between the wisdom that the Greeks had, which was trying to separate out, and Christ's wisdom, which was trying to restore and reconcile. When Jesus was talking about wisdom in Matthew 11, he says, you know, the Father hid things from the wise and revealed these things to little children. And he went on to say that God did this out of sheer delight. God loves to share wisdom, to share truth with those entirely untouched by intellectual worth, the little children. And that's the freedom of God. God delights in sharing knowledge. And that's what we do at the Lord's Supper. We share this relational wisdom together, the intimacy of the Trinity, handing it on to each other, as Paul says, what I receive from the Lord, I'm also going to pass on to you. Greeks used wisdom to elevate themselves and give them a sense of superiority. But for Jesus, wisdom elevates intimacy, being pulled closely to the maker of the universe. And Paul was saying to the Greeks, your wisdom's not going to get you to this place. Verse 21, he says, the world will not be able to know God through your wisdom. But then he goes on to say, out of God's choosing, God's decision, God's delight. That's the word connected to doxology and glory. Out of God's delight, God invites us to participate in communion through Christ's broken body. You see, the Greeks in their own imaginations could never have conceived that reconciliation would come through the cross. It was a horrible idea to anyone who was Greek. The idea of looking at the cross in, in the Roman Empire carried such scorn and such stigma. They just couldn't get there through their own knowledge. But this is where Jesus invites us to be participants in the communion of the Trinity. No participant in the Lord's Supper is able to regard their own knowledge as making them worthy. It's only through what God offers to us. And this is where the unity of the church happens, through communion, through Christ's shed blood and broken body. Sometimes we try to create unity and reconciliation, don't we, through shared ideas, starting with doctrine, getting our beliefs all lined up. Sometimes other people try to get unity through shared practice, making our practices consistent and uniform. But the danger is if we put these things before what happens at the table, before the grace received through Christ's broken body and shed blood, then we become judges. We become superior. We decide who's correct. We decide who's doing it right. But it's in the sacraments. It demands that we sit under the truth of Christ's love for us, that our entire identity is defined and determined by how Jesus willingly chose to offer his body to us, to give us life. I wonder if you noticed in this hymn how it's bookended at the start and at the end. Paul is very intentional in how he structures his hymns. He begins with a quote from the Old Testament at the start. In verse 21, he quotes from Isaiah, the passage we read in the Old Testament earlier on. And in the closing argument, he also quotes from the Old Testament in Jeremiah about boasting in the Lord. Now, why does Paul do this so intentionally? Why does he bookend his hymn with quotes? Well, I think Paul was attempting to, on the one hand, deconstruct what was false in Jewish identity, but also to reconstruct what was true. The Greeks were looking for wisdom 
Paul now shifts to the Jews and says, you're not looking for wisdom, you're looking for power. You're looking for wonder. You're looking for a demonstration of a miracle that's going to get you out of this low place you've sunk to in society. The Jews were now this political minority and their backs were against the wall. And they were looking for this political Messiah to come in and rescue them. They were looking for a revolutionary to offer them national freedom and, and sovereignty. They remembered how God had done it in the past. He'd split open the Red Sea. Could God not come and do the same wonder again and help us? If the Greeks are looking for wisdom, the Jews wanted wonder. Not just wanted, but it says they demanded. They demanded wonder. Do it again, Lord. Knock our socks off. Set us free. It's so tempting, isn't it? They simply wanted to know that God was on their side. Who can blame them? That God was for them. That God was going to baptize their own preferences. Over the past few months, as you know, in council, we've been discussing many things to do with the, the synodical report. And a phrase we've been so mindful of is how are we conscious of not simply baptizing our own preferences, of fashioning God after our own image? Are we simply baptizing our preferences of how we think the church should be? How do we release Christianity from the suburban captivity of the church where we all just want to be comfortable? The Greeks desired wisdom, but the Jews demanded, demanded a sign. And I know within my own heart, I've been caught in that place of demand. God, you'd better do this. You'd better come through for us in this way time and again. And I've had to come to the table and leave the demand and the desire down. The Jews demanded a sign. And yet, Paul says, rather than offering them the miracle that they so desperately wanted, Paul says, God gave you an anti-miracle. God gives you the cross. God shows a place where God will be at his weakest, where God will stand in darkness, where it'll seem like other powers are going to win. And it seems as if Paul is deconstructing all these thoughts of Jewish identity, but in reality, Paul is taking them to a place where they can find their truest identity again. Ken Bailey argues that what is happening here is a reconstruction, not a deconstruction. Because Paul is pointing them back into the Old Testament, back into their history, and saying, do you remember Isaiah and what he said? He talked about the suffering servant. He talked about one who would be tormented by persecutors. He talked about one willing to suffer without retaliation. And so Paul, when he introduces the cross, he's not saying this wipes out who you are and you have to hold on to something different. But rather, Paul is saying this is going to summon out the, the finest expression of who you are, the truest identity of who you are. And not just for you, but for the Greeks too. Though they didn't have the same Jewish tradition to rely on, they too had powerful traditions of heroes who died to save their people. And again, Ken Bailey says that in this hymn, Paul is touching on the deep Greek traditions of Pericles, stories of heroes, of how Athenian heroes would sacrifice themselves to save the nation. And Bailey suggests that when Paul talks about all these things, he's summoning out the truest identity that we can find through the cross. The Jews were being invited to look at the crucified Messiah through the lens of the suffering servant. The Jews thought they could boast in their chosenness, 
in their special identity. But God in Jesus turns this on its head and says, now because of the cross, everyone is part of this story. Everyone's invited into the family. The Greeks, on the other hand, thought they could boast in their philosophy, in their impressive civilization. But again, God and Jesus turns this on its head to say that the most radical civilization comes from the cross, where wisdom means relational intimacy with our maker. So don't boast, Paul says. Don't boast in a way that's going to make you superior. Don't boast to create the illusion you can do this on your own, that you don't need anyone. But boast in the cross, because it's in the cross you'll find all the answers to the questions you've ever asked about your existence. This hymn of the cross reorients us to realize God delights in pouring out grace. We find in it an invitation to confront the places where wisdom is crucifying us, where the need to have the right words said in the right way with the right practice, we bring it to the cross and we acknowledge all is grace. And we're only here because Christ has called us here. The hymn of the cross reorients us to realize God weeps when power is used in brutal ways. God weeps when there's brutal displays of power where force is used so brutally that a grown man cries out for his mother, someone who had his whole life in front of him. What will it take to put these weapons of power down? We need the wisdom of the cross where love and justice and forgiveness and mercy all meet. We can't get there on our own. And so you see this hymn of the cross is magnificent because we witness a Messiah who is a bridge not just to the deepest parts of our own identity, but a bridge out to all the cultures of the world and shows a pathway to deep acceptance. The possibility that the nobodies of the world become somebodies. And so Paul finishes with this wonderful flourish in verse 30. He says, if you can come to the cross, if you can lay down your demands, if you can lay down your desires, this is what you get. Three words, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. Three words that bring together the Trinity, God's action in the world, God clothing us with righteousness, making us clean. The Holy Spirit inhabiting our lives to make us holy. And finally, Jesus redeeming us, setting us free from destructive habits and patterns. No more need we fear being stuck in patterns that are destructive and harmful. This is our identity, righteous, sanctified, redeemed. And so when Justo Gonzalez was talking about education being this ladder and how harmful that can be, how elitist it can be, he offers an alternative image. And I think this is a good image to leave this place with. He said, rather than thinking of your knowledge and wisdom as enabling you to climb a ladder, think of it as an irrigation hose which just slowly seeps out to the earth to bring life. It's like a leaky hose where grace is being poured out all over the land so that anybody can drink from it, constantly drinking in the goodness of God and the goodness of grace, where everybody becomes a somebody, where rather than splitting into ethnic silos, we're bringing the best of who we are into the communion circle and sharing it with others. Where rather than hiding how deeply 
the things we don't know, the things we don't understand, struggling in the dark night of our souls, we realize at the cross we have someone who sees us. That place where we know we're not as clever as we'd like to be, nor as competent as we think we'd like to be, but Christ comes and says, let me take that burden off you. Let me journey with you. So in closing, how might this hymn of the cross land with you today? For some of you, maybe the invitation is to reframe your vocation from being this ladder of steps to get from one place to the other and become an irrigation pipe, freely giving away information and knowledge rather than looking over your shoulder to see who's watching. Just like the Advent dance that I love here at COS where parents maybe sheepishly are dancing with their children but they're passing it on, the good news that Jesus will come again because they know this is worth passing on to the next generation, leaving aside self-consciousness to participate in the dance of grace, letting the grace leak out. For others of you, maybe there's a call as you enter the communion circle today to lay down some of the desires and demands you've been pushing at God over the past few months. Just lay it down. See how Christ might regenerate what's deep inside you anyway because Christ knows you better than you can know yourself. Give it back to him. And maybe for some of you, there's simply an invitation to intimacy. Rather than living in the place of knowledge or the place of hopelessness, there's that invitation to come and drink deep from the well of grace. And the way to access that place is simply through prayer. To say, God, come to me. Show me who you are. Teresa Davila, she talks about reaching this place, about increasing our prayer life. She describes it like being a donkey that draws on the well waters. She says, just keep on praying. Keep on praying. Prayer is like the little donkey that draws the water wheel. Though their eyes are shut and they have no idea what they're doing, these donkeys will draw more water than the gardener can with all his efforts. If you want to reach that place of intimacy, simply pray, Lord Jesus, come. I know you can fill my deepest need. And so it's fitting as we respond to the hymn of the cross, we respond with this other hymn, Be Thou My Vision, Riches I Heed Not, nor vain empty praise, thou mine inheritance now and always, thou and thou only first in my heart, high King of heaven, my treasure thou art. High King of heaven, victory won, may I reach heaven's joys, O bright heaven's sun, heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler of all. Let's stand and worship.